Hey guys, this is Mr. Mahmood, and you're watching Biochem Lecture 2. In this video, we're going to get into two other major components of organic compounds. Uh, in this video, we're going to cover lipids and nucleic acids. We've already covered the concept of monomer to polymer, uh, and we've focused in specifically on carbohydrates as the major energy source for the body. Now we're going to get into key components here for the body, which are the lipids and nucleic acids, their major functions, the structures of each, why they're so important, and how you can distinguish between them. To start, we're going to cover the lipids, and then we're going to pull into nucleic acids. Now, the nucleic acids section that we're going to cover here is really just going to be an intro. We're going to spend an entire unit on nucleic acids later in the year because they're extremely important when we cover the concept of biology. Uh, as hopefully you might already know, the Na in DNA actually stands for nucleic acid. So DNA and RNA are examples of these, so we're going to cover them in all kinds of detail later. We're just going to do a very basic intro here just to have a comparison with the other major organic compounds. But we will spend most of our time here in discussing lipids because they are critical for the functioning of your body. Okay. All right, so to get started, when we talk about the structure of lipids, again with carbohydrates, we focused a lot about the monomer relation to the polymer. The monomer was the monosaccharide, and then the polymer was multiple monosaccharides bonded together to form a polysaccharide, right? So it was one piece was the monomer and then a long chain was the polymer. Lipids don't really work that way. Uh, a lipid structure, the structure that we're going to talk about here, is what we consider the polymer. So when we talk about what the monomer is of a lipid, we're really just going to break it down into the components that make up its structure. Okay, so it's not necessarily going to be one and then a chain of the exact same things. It's more about the parts as the monomers, and then the whole lipid together is what we consider to be the polymer. So a lipid component, and the basic lipid that we're going to represent here, is made up of two key components. The first component is a vertical line that we consider glycerol. This is what we consider a, a glycerol molecule. Uh, this molecule contains three carbons, it has hydrogens, and it has oxygens. These are the three elements that you're going to find in any lipid. So this is very similar to carbohydrates. You guys remember carbohydrates are made of carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens? Same thing's true about lipids, except it's a much different structure, and lipids are actually significantly larger. Okay, so, but they're made up of this backbone that we consider a glycerol backbone. And then there are three extensions that come off of them, and they're all what we consider fatty acid tails. So each of these extensions is what we consider a fatty acid tail or a fatty acid chain. So the whole molecule together, the whole lipid molecule, is made up of a glycerol backbone, the vertical line, and then three fatty acid extensions or fatty acid tails that come off of them. So when you combine all of this together, that's going to form your lipid molecule. All right, now in order to actually make this molecule that is the lipid, all of these components put together, it's going to be combined in a very similar way that we talked about with carbohydrates. Remember, carbohydrates combine through dehydration synthesis. It's the exact same concept that's going to happen here, except with carbohydrates, remember it was all just two combining at one point, and that made the chain, and it was all basically just a, a single horizontal chain. In this case, there's going to be three separate sites for dehydration synthesis to occur to get each fatty acid chain or each fatty acid tail to combine to that glycerol molecule. So the actual dehydration synthesis process is going to happen with these four elements in each of the positions here to connect the fatty acid chain to the glycerol molecule. So with each of these components, notice how there are two hydrogens and two oxygens. Right? And remember we talked about dehydration synthesis before. Dehydration means you take out a water to combine two things together. Synthesis is to combine, dehydration is to take out the water. And that's exactly what's going to happen here in each one of these parts. I have it kind of formatted a little bit differently here so you can see it actually happening. So in each one of these areas, the top, middle, and the bottom, the water molecule is going to be lost and then that oxygen is going to hold the fatty acid tail with that glycerol molecule. So now we have the first fatty acid tail attached to the glycerol molecule. Same thing happens in the middle to allow the second fatty acid tail to combine, again losing a water molecule in the process. And then the third one will also lose a water molecule. That oxygen will be the connecting piece that puts it all together. So in the process of making this large-scale lipid through dehydration synthesis, it had to occur three times in each place you lost a water molecule. So if I asked you how many water molecules do you lose in dehydration synthesis for a lipid, the answer is three, because each fatty acid tail 
has to combine and lose the water in the process. So this is what you're left with, is what we consider a basic lipid molecule. This is also commonly referred to as a triglyceride. Let's break that down and see if we can figure out why. What does the prefix tri mean? Three, exactly. So what do you think the three represents here? What are there three of in this molecule? Fatty acid tails, exactly. So there are three fatty acid tails, and what's it attached to? What's that vertical part called? A glycerol. So if I consider this to be a triglyceride, that should make complete sense to you. It's a glycerol backbone with three fatty acid tails extending off of it. So I would call it a triglyceride. So one thing I want you to think about here, to remember the structure of this lipid molecule, of this triglyceride, is to think of this whole concept. You see a whole lot of C's, H's, and O's. I know it can be a little distracting, but think of the basic skeleton of this molecule. Pretty much if you think of this as sort of like a big capital E, then that should be a good way to remember what a triglyceride or this lipid structure looks like. So if you look carefully here, can you see a big capital E in this molecule? With the glycerol as the vertical line and then three fatty acid tails coming off, it kind of looks like it, right? You can kind of visualize this E. Actually, probably like a really long E, right, with each of the lines extending out a little further, but you get the idea. It's a glycerol backbone and then three fatty acid tails kind of extending off of it. Okay. Now, when we talk about the functions of lipids, we're going to discuss them. one of the major functions being its ability to store energy and be used as energy. So we talk about lipids quite a bit when we refer to energy. Uh, if you don't already know, lipids are what we refer to as fats. So they're the same thing. So anytime you're talking about fats, we're talking about lipids here. So you should know that lipids and fats play a role in your diet, but it's usually not something you're encouraged to have in excessive amounts, right? So there's a reason for that. When we talk about energy, the fact that it's just its sheer size is so much different than a glucose molecule, than a, a typical sugar, is both a great thing and a horrible thing for your body when it comes to using it in terms of energy. Let's first start with the good news, right? A glucose molecule, remember, only has a few elements. It only has six carbons, 12 hydrogens, six oxygens, right? And so it's the bonds that holds these elements together that actually stores all of that potential energy that you can turn around and use for your cells. And it's in breaking those bonds that the energy is actually released and passed on to something else so it can be used for chemical reactions. So in actuality, the more chemical bonds there are in a molecule, the more potential energy there is to be stored within that molecule. So the bigger the molecule, the more stored energy there is because it's the bonds that hold them together. So the fact that lipid molecules are so much larger than a glucose molecule, just a reminder, remember, this is what a glucose molecule looks like. It may, you may have thought of it as big back then, but you compare it to this, it's nothing. So there aren't nearly as many chemical bonds in a glucose molecule as there is, say, in a lipid molecule. And this is just an example of a lipid. Usually each one of these fatty acid tails extends out significantly further than this. So a whole lot of bonds are available in a lipid. So the good news is with that many bonds, there's a whole lot of stored energy that's possible there. So your body loves that. Your body wants to keep energy as much as possible so that if it needed it in the future, it'll use it. It's just like somebody gave you a $1,000. Even if you had money already in your bank, you're not going to say no. You'll take the thousand dollars because you never know. There might be a rainy day sometime where you need that thousand dollars. So you'll always accept the money and your body is the same way. Your body loves fats and it'll always accept fats that you take in and it'll do everything it can to keep from getting rid of them. It'll try to store as much of that fat as possible for a rainy day or for some sort of a future scenario where you're just in desperation for energy. And the reality is in common times most people aren't desperate for energy. They usually eat fairly well, but your body hasn't figured that out yet and it still just tries to store up as many lipids as possible. So we'll get into why lipids in excess is, is not a good thing, but in terms of energy your body loves to keep it because of its size. It has so many chemical bonds that it actually can store a whole lot more energy than a typical sugar molecule could. So that's the good news. That's the good side. But there's a downside. And hopefully you remember what we talked about with the, my, uh, my currency analogy of using euros out in, uh, out in Europe. If you're in a country that only accepts euros and you have euros and dollars, you're going to want to use up your euros first because you don't want to waste any time trying to convert the dollars to euros and losing money in the, in the exchange rate and all the problems that come with that. So you're, you're always going to use what's most readily available and what 
other people accept. The same thing's true with your body. Your body wants carbohydrates because it uses those carbohydrates immediately. That's how you can turn around and make the energy source that your cells need for chemical reactions. But lipids have to be first converted into this glucose molecule. Remember what that glucose looks like. It has to be converted into a glucose molecule, into something similar at least, in long chains, in order to actually turn around and be used as energy for the cells. So yes, even though it's large and it can store a whole lot of energy, if I actually wanted to use its energy and convert it to something that the cells can use, I'd have to first break the, this extremely differently structured molecule of a lipid into things that look a whole lot more like glucose before I can actually turn around and use it in the reaction. And just like going from dollars to euros, there's a conversion rate. Your body is going to charge you for this because if I want to break bonds apart of a lipid and turn it into something else, I need to put energy in to break those bonds. They don't just break out of nowhere. You have to force them to be broken. So that energy being put in is energy that's lost. And so by the time you actually convert it into something to use for energy, the net gain is low which means I've already used up a whole lot of energy in the process, so even though I might have made some energy, really it doesn't seem like I made all that much. Because of its size, it's actually both good and bad for energy storage. It's great because it can store a whole lot more energy. It's not so good because it has to be broken down and converted into glucose first before it can then turn around and be used as an energy source. So some key things I want you to remember about the basic structure of a lipid here. So again, I referred to lipids as fats. And in order for you to identify the different types of fats, you can actually do that by looking at the lipid molecule. Now, you've probably heard of different categories of fats before. They all have to do with the fatty acid tails that extend off of them. So let's start with the basic category. So when I get into a given fatty acid tail, and this is the example that I gave you in the line without the uh, carbon and double bonded oxygens there at the beginning. Don't worry about that. But if you look at a basic uh, chain of a fatty acid tail like this, and it looks like this, it has C's all the way down the line, all single bonds, and all hydrogens completely surrounding it. This is what we consider a, a fatty acid tail that has the full amount of hydrogens available. If you look at it, you couldn't put another hydrogen in any place because of the way that carbon uh, needs to bond. Each of these carbons needs to have four bonds. And if they're all single bonds, that means there's one electron being shared between each of these components. Everywhere you see a bond, that's a shared electron. So everywhere you look, you can sit here and do the math, you can count it, you can pause it and look if you want. Every carbon has four bonds, and every hydrogen has one, because that's how they become happy and stable as well. So if I have a long chain like this, it's all single bonds, then this is the most that uh, any other elements like hydrogen can combine around it. Every carbon is completely surrounded by hydrogens and the hydrogens are happy too. So there, this is where you have the most hydrogens possible. This is what we consider a saturated fatty acid. Saturated means there's, it's already reached its max on what you can add. Right? If something is saturated, that means it's hit its limit. So this fatty acid tail is saturated with hydrogens. It has hydrogens all around it. There's no space where you see a gap that would normally fit a hydrogen. So this is what we consider a saturated fatty acid, also known as a saturated fat. So you guys probably look on nutrition labels um, of things that you're eating, and you look at the fat content, and they'll tell you what the total fat is, and then they'll usually break it down into either saturated or unsaturated. This is a saturated fat because it's saturated with hydrogens around that fatty acid tail. Now because of this, the fatty acid tail itself stays horizontal. It stays kind of in a straight line because all of these elements have electrons and the electrons are all the same charge so they naturally want to get as far away from each other as they can. But if you have everything kind of in a uniform formation like this, then the hydrogens to get as far away from each other will stay straight upright. They don't want to angle too close to any one or the other so they'll just all stay vertical and this makes this formation so the actual line itself stays straight. So all you need to remember is with saturated fats the fatty acid tails stay straight. So if you think about um, stacking a whole bunch of these lipid molecules and compacting them in one place we're talking about lipid molecules that are all extending with uh, straight fatty acid tails. So if you have a whole bunch of straight fatty acid tails, then they can combine and kind of clump over each other and really compact in this area very easily, like basically stacking a, a, you know, 500 sheets of paper on top of each other. They can stack and compact really easily. So because they can all compact really easily, since they're all straight lines, they can really compact neatly, 
they're so dense that saturated fats are actually solid at room temperature because of their density because all these fatty acid tails are straight they can all really compact and they become solid at room temperature so great examples of saturated fats so think about fats that are solid at room temperature would be butter and animal fats if you guys ever uh, you know take slices of bacon or you buy some uh, some steak at the grocery store or things like that before you cook them you see a lot of white around it what they call marbling that's fat that's animal fat and it's solid at room temperature But once you cook it a lot of that fat melts away right so these are what we consider saturated fats again great examples are uh, butter and animal fats okay now if you introduce a type of bond that's not just single but a double bond into that fatty acid tail then you're introducing something that's no longer completely surrounded by hydrogens and let's walk through why real quickly let's like let's take a look at this third carbon from the left and the third carbon from the right each of them still needs four bonds right just like the one above it except this time two of the bonds are going to be ha uh, held between the carbons directly so instead of just sharing one electron they're actually going to be sharing two between those two carbons so because two of the bonds are already happening there in the middle you only each carbon only needs two more bonds in order to become stable so you'll notice the carbon on the left for example the third carbon from the left it bonds with the carbon before it so it only needs one hydrogen in order to make that fourth bond remember it already has two with the other carbon two with the one before it and then one with the hydrogen above it that makes four so because it has all four bonds it needs it doesn't need a hydrogen in this space so now there's a gap there and the same thing's true for the carbon on the right two of the bonds are with the carbon before it one of the bonds is with the carbon after it so it only needs one more to make four and again leaves a gap underneath so this gap is going to be a very important component remember I said before how these hydrogens want to get as far away from each other as they can but because they're so stacked in uh, kind of compacted together the furthest away they can get from the other hydrogens would just be to stay vertical but look at the ones on the bottom now now you have these hydrogens that have a whole lot of space in between because there's a whole lot of space here in between these hydrogens are actually going to work to get things kind of moving a little bit and the same thing is going to be true on the other side these hydrogens on the outside on the other side want to spread out as much as they can so because these hydrogens underneath have a whole lot of space to work with they, they want to get as far away from the hydrogens next to them as possible and these ones on the top want to expand from each other as well they're going to work so hard that they're actually going to cause that double bond in between to bend and so this fatty acid tail isn't going to be straight it's actually going to bend and this is going to be sort of what's considered a kink or kind of like a fold a little bend or a crease on that fatty acid tail right where you see that double bond because there's a huge gap underneath since that double bond was there so because of that kink now each of these fatty acid tails are no longer the streamlined horizontal line now they have little kinks and little bends within them so now imagine taking some let's say uh, you had 500 note cards and you just stack them on top of each other that's a fairly small stack now take each one of those note cards and fold them in half so now there's a huge fold or crease in between them and then try to stack them up and if you're folding them in different places try to stack them up then so now if you take a whole bunch of these unsaturated fats and you try to stack them and they're all kind of folded at different places they're not gonna be in this uniform line like we had before so what you're left with is a a bunch of unsaturated fats here these fats are no longer saturated because there's gaps now there's areas where there are no hydrogens these unsaturated fats are now going to be in, in in a collection that's not nearly as compacted not nearly as condensed as a saturated fats so because these aren't going to compact as much they're less dense and therefore they're liquid at room temperature so all of the things all of the fats that you think of that are liquid at room temperature are actually unsaturated fats and they have unsaturated fatty acid tails these are your oils so all of the different oils you think of the naturally produced oils are uh, examples of unsaturated fats olive oil all of the vegetable oils fruit oils uh, different oils from different types of nuts cashews peanuts things like that all of those oils are what we consider unsaturated fats now because of the way that they're structured uh, they are actually a little easier for your body to break down 
if they needed it for sources of energy, and they're actually easier to break down so that they can be used for other functions in the body besides just energy. So of the two, you've probably heard this before, unsaturated fats are much more highly encouraged in your diet than saturated fats. Saturated fats are so hard to work with because they're just so compacted. They're so dense since they're all flat lines like this. They're just so compacted and dense. They're really hard to separate, really hard to break apart, really hard to work with. And your body's basically lazy. It does as little work as it has to do, as little work as possible. So if it had the choice between breaking down an, a series of unsaturated fats below or a series of saturated fats, they're going to choose the unsaturated because they're easier to get to because all these little kinks make it so they're not so close to each other and they're more easily worked with. So always, uh, they always encourage you to have higher amounts of unsaturated fats in your diet than you do saturated. We've kind of hit a few points. We've kind of hit a few points about what lipids actually do already. Just as a quick review, remember my currency analogy from before. Your body prefers carbohydrates. So if you have a choice and your body has both carbohydrates and lipids ready to use for energy, it'll always use. And then if, and then if you still needed energy from that, then they'll be forced to convert your lipids. So your lipids do serve uh, a possible function of, of uh, being an available energy source, but it's only if your carbohydrate level is extremely low. And that's because in order to turn a fat into something that can be used as energy, it has to first be broken down into something like a carbohydrate, and that in itself takes energy. So your body wants to avoid using energy to make energy. You'd rather just have it immediately ready and be able to get a pure profit out of it. So that's why these uh, low carb diets work the way they do. If you eliminate or extremely lessen the amount of carbohydrates you take in, you're forcing your body to take those fats and convert them to something that you can turn around and use as energy. And that process uses up a whole lot of energy as well. So it really breaks your body down. Those cells are working uh, significantly harder just to try to make the same basic amount of energy that you would get from straight glucose or from straight sugar. So uh, even though it works in the short term, it really wears your body down if you're forcing a constant conversion of lipids to energy. It's great in the fact that lipids are so large, so there's a whole lot of energy available that could be stored, but to use it, you have to work quite a bit to get it to turn around. So one major function of lipids is basic uh, uh, energy structure, and really it's more about long-term storage of energy. Carbohydrates or your lipids are there for your long-term energy storage. But the major reason you should really be taking lipids in, yes, it is a, a, a secondary source of energy for you, but within all of your cells, one of the major components of the cell is something called the cell membrane, which we'll spend a whole lot of time, an entire unit on later in the year. What you need to know now is that the majority of that cell membrane is made up of lipids. And when you're creating new cells and cells are dividing and forming again, you're constantly needing lipids to be brought in so that you can reform new membranes or help, uh, help replace or uh, repair damaged or destroyed cells in order to keep cells functioning the way they do. That cell membrane is very important for the functioning of a cell and it's, and it's uh, primarily made of these lipids. And the lipids are represented in this diagram as a little yellow squiggly lines that are in the middle. Uh, but this diagram doesn't do it justice. It's, it's a high proportion of a cell membrane. So lipids play an important role in that. So if you didn't take in lipids in your diet, you wouldn't be able to make all these uh, changes and, and repairs and reformations of your cell membranes in your cells, which would cause your cells to die. So it is critical that you keep lipids in your diet. You can't eliminate fats completely from your diet, but it's all about moderation. You definitely don't want to have too many lipids be brought in because, again, your body is going to do whatever it can to store them. And if you are bringing lipids in in high amounts, you definitely want to have more of the unsaturated lipids brought in and used than you do saturated fats. All right, so that's a basic breakdown of lipids. Hopefully, it, it helps open your eyes a little bit to what you hear on a daily basis about fats and looking at a nutrition label. Now you understand what everything means, right? Uh, and again, I told you the nucleic acid structure uh, discussion was going to be very brief. I'm going to be very quick here because we're going to spend a whole unit on nucleic acids when we get into DNA later. But the basic component of nucleic acids gets us back to the monomer-polymer discussion. Remember, carbohydrates had the monomer, like a glucose molecule or a monosaccharide, and then the polymer was a lot of monomers combined together. Nucleic acids work in much the same way. They have a basic building block or basic component, and then the whole structure is just a bunch of these monomers combined together. Now in this case, what you see here is the basic component for a nucleic acid. This molecule is what we consider a nucleotide. Okay? A nucleotide is the monomer of a nucleic acid, just like a monosaccharide is the monomer of a carbohydrate. 
And when we think about the monomers of a lipid, hopefully you remember, we just talked about the parts. So the glycerol and the three fatty acid tails are the monomer of a lipid. Right? So then the polymer, in this case, would be the whole nucleic acid structure. So many uh, like DNA nucleotides combine together to make the whole DNA structure. So the whole DNA molecule would again be what we consider the polymer, just like we consider the whole lipid or the whole triglyceride the polymer. So this is what we consider a monomer, it's a nucleotide. A nucleotide is broken down into three parts. Okay? The three parts are a phosphate, and that's the phosphate group that you see up there. My honors kids hopefully should be able to recognize that as one of the functional groups I told you about before. The phosphate group is attached to a five carbon sugar. And if you look here in the structure and molecule in the middle, you should be able to count five carbons. And you start from the first carbon which is actually on the right. So this is carbon one, this is carbon two, this is carbon three, this one's carbon four, and then the fifth carbon is what attaches to that phosphate group that extends out there. So this is the five carbon sugar here in the middle. And then finally, you have one of four different categories of nitrogen bases that are connected to the sugar. So the three parts of a nucleotide are the phosphate, the sugar, and a nitrogen base. Okay? Now, there are two different categories of nucleic acids. Uh, there is what we consider DNA, and there is what we consider RNA. The D and the R actually stand for the type of sugar that's in the nucleotide. And it all has to do with a single oxygen. So DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. RNA stands for ribonucleic acid. And the difference is in the sugar. If this sugar molecule here, this one here in the middle with the five carbons, has an oxygen with this hydrogen in this place here from the second carbon, if it has the oxygen, then this was considered ribose. But because this one, as you can see, has no oxygen, that oxygen is missing, there's no oxygen here, this is what we call a deoxyd ribose. It's deoxyd, meaning that oxygen is taking out. So this is actually deoxyribose. This sugar is called deoxyribose because it doesn't have an oxygen in that place. If it did have an oxygen in that place, then it would be considered ribose. So that's one quick way that you can identify the difference between the two types of nucleic acids. This is a DNA nucleotide because it has a deoxyribose sugar as its sugar. Okay? And you don't need to memorize too much of this yet. Just know the basic parts of a, of a nucleic acid are the nucleotide. The nucleotide has three parts, a phosphate, a sugar, and a nitrogen base. This one in particular is a deoxyribose sugar, and this base is, is called a thymine base. And again, we'll get to that later. You don't really have to know that yet. Uh, so this kind of diagram walks you through the basic uh, types. Again, we just need to know two examples of nucleic acids. The full polymer is what's considered either DNA or RNA. DNA is your uh, genetic component. It's what stores your genetic information. The DNA in a eukaryotic cell, which is a term hopefully you'll know very soon, is always found in the nucleus because it's very important not to be damaged. So the DNA is, is critical for your genetic information. It's your DNA that turns around and makes all of the components that your cells need in order to function properly. It's your DNA that knows what your cells should be doing and it's your DNA that makes you who you are. So DNA and that function and component of nucleic acids is critical. The RNA plays an important role in helping to make proteins that turn around and help perform your functions. So the DNA knows the information, knows what your cells need to do, but it's the RNA that helps make the proteins that turn around and, and do what you need. So we'll get more into that later. Just remember, DNA stores your genetic information. RNA helps to make proteins that help work to allow your cells to function the way they should. And the monomer of a nucleic acid is that nucleotide, the three-part nucleotide that we talked about before. This nucleotide molecule has a phosphate, a sugar, and a nitrogen base. And the nitrogen base can be any of, the, any of these varieties that you see here, whether we're talking about DNA or RNA. Uh, and the sugar, if it's DNA, is deoxyribose, which means it doesn't have that oxygen on the second carbon. If it's RNA, it has ribose as the sugar. It, it does have that oxygen in that second carbon. Okay, so just remember some of the basics there about nucleic acids. That's really all you need to know for now. We're going to cover nucleic acids again more in detail. So hopefully this is helping you build your understanding of organic compounds. You have a good understanding of carbohydrates. You understand lipids. So now I think hopefully your overall nutrition uh, is going to be a little more educated and you'll have a little bit of a, of a better way of 
figuring out what it is that you want to eat and how you want to balance all the different things that you bring into your body to determine what your body needs the most of and to make sure you get it. We'll continue next time with proteins and kind of hit the trifecta of your nutritional intake. All right, guys, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.